conditions on the lawn, having a cigarette, and what's in See, your bottle? See, that's what I said beer. That's what I said. This would be tea. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> tea. A tea toddler. Fish. We got fish and chips. Yeah. But chips isn't on camera right now. She might come to the entry. So, uh, what should we ask him first? Where were you last night? Sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> mm, oh, yeah. It's, I went to Dave's, drank beer, got home at 7, and fell asleep, woke up at 2 in the morning. We are, we are physical distancing, we're not social distancing. Fish, what are you up to lately? What am I up to? Well, since this COVID virus thing has happened, not a whole lot of not anything. Lot. We're just getting prepared. Well, I'm getting prepared. I've got all this musical gear, and I'm getting it all repaired now. I'm trying to tighten up on my wrist whenever I can, if she lets me. <laughs> Let's talk about all your gear a little bit later, but uh, what about your bands? What's your favorite... Uh, project right now oh that'd be southern fried for sure for sure okay southern fried is uh well we've been at it since 2002 <laughs> it's not just a half and half band but tell us more about it uh it's basically a southern rock tribute uh we do leonard skinner and allman brothers mainly and we can be hired to do either full sets we're actually we were supposed That's to actually do man. niagara falls at the niagara falls uh seneca theater mm -hmm. we we're going to do a, the two album sides oh nice two albums first and second album but uh, that got cancelled so that's unfortunate uh, trying to make ourselves marketable like uh, slice per slice cut per cut like uh, Craig Martin likes with his classic right. album live he's one of our biggest fans oh yeah he's come out to see us at the Lindsmore and just raves about how good the musicians are and really great his guitarists are usually in our band in fact uh, he got one of our first guitarists Rob Phillips from our band oh really Rob well Rob is multi-talented yeah so it just great seems David Gilmore yeah. Oh, yeah. So to limit him with uh, Leonard Skidder and stuff like that, like it's just Holds closes him, back, him up. Certainly. So yeah. Craig Martin gave him uh, the wings to fly, and that's what really? he's doing right now. Oh, good for him. But we got so many other guitarists that want to be in the band, especially Bob Strone and uh, Bill Border are now in the band. And uh, they're doing great. Those are your most recent players. And oh, how long have those guys been with the band? Uh, they've been with the band for about a year and a half now. I'd like to describe it as two new engines for the fucking chassis. Right on. It makes us fly. These guys learn things note for note, oh, yeah. cut for cut, and they have a feel for the actual flavor. They actually have the right sounds for Southern Fried, which has a lot, a lot of Southern Rock isn't heavily distorted like heavy metal guys. That's right. You know, that's more of a clean sound with a bit of an edge. That's right. And these guys pull it off religiously. Uh, and these, these guys are really good. I really love them. That's cool. Uh, but I do miss Chris Heine. Uh, he was a phenomenal talent. He uses 12 stage on his last ball. So that's a very heavy string. Very, very heavy string. And watching him bend and use a slide, he was a natural talent. But uh, Those guys work him, together great too, Norm and him. Norm and him, but they always had to come from Lindsay to rehearse. Oh, yeah. So that was the reason why they just had enough. They... Yeah. Had a good few years with us, but the trip from Lindsay just to rehearse new songs is just too much for them. Right, right. And we understood that. And me and Dave just wanted to learn more songs, and they couldn't do it. And two other integral members of your band who have been with you for a long time. Oh, that'd be uh, Jim Knuckles Chessworth. I don't know why we call him Knuckles. <laughs> He's a pacifist. <laughs> <laughs> mm, he passed the fist. <laughs> no. That's your and keyboard player. And we have Jerry Fielding. Uh, he's one of our oldest members, but man, that guy can drum. <laughs> Jerry's a cool guy. Mm -hmm. Jerry Fielding, storied Jerry Fielding, and uh, and Knuckles, and uh, great keyboard solos, and great drumming. Skinner is not easy blues by any means. Well, it's a we're, study. We're trying to copy it note for note like yeah. you see jam bands they get together and they just listen to the song don't really listen to nuances yeah. and it comes off never sounding like the original oh, you guys really do where i try to study the bass lines and jerry actually studies the actual drum lines if you got the actual rhythm section doing everything almost note for note you give the guitarist and the keyboard player free flow so let's get to your leading man mm, dave dave dave's so not this is, here this is one of the <laughs> One of the reasons that your tribute is like the best Skinner, maybe in the world, because Dave sounds so much like... It's a natural voice for him. Like Ronnie. <coughs> Ronnie. 
real good baritone on him. Like, yeah. yeah, if he was a backup singer, he'd give great bow, 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 bow. And you really help him out. Like, I, that's where your uh, backing vocals really stand out. I mean, you do backing vocals in other things and in jams that you've done for years and stuff like that. But your Skinner backing vocals really stand out. And I think you're the only singer in that, the only other singer. Yes. Right on. Yeah. That's so, really got to hand it me on that. Sometimes when the budget's big enough, we hire the chicklets. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, we haven't had, had, had to hire them in years. Uh, Lisa Gia and uh, the other girl I can't remember. Please forgive me. <laughs> okay. uh, it'll come back to me. Uh, but as yeah. it stands now, it's just so much easier just to keep the six of us going the way we are. Right, so that would make it an eight-person band. Yeah. Wow. Well, we're actually Big looking time. to add a new guitarist so we can have a three-guitar band before wow. we get the girl singers because Dave it's really wants... It's supposed to be a three-guitar band. It's supposed to be a three-guitar band, exactly. Do, they, do the guys switch off? Like, do you have a guy that plays the character of that guy? Or... Because uh, I know they, Gary Rosington is the only, uh, the only original member of Left in Skin. Uh, they actually just choose what they like to do. Uh, they discuss who's going to do the rhythm, who's going to do the lead. They, sure. they leave it in their capable hands yeah. to do it. They cool. do their own arrangements. Me and Dave just go, thank you, excellent. <laughs> Smile a lot when it sounds like the record. <laughs> so, uh, okay, well, that's your current favorite project, I guess. Anything else you want to talk about currently? Uh, well, bands? let's see. We did have a Bob Seger tribute called Live Bullet. Uh, we right. actually had a show, but that With was Dave as well. too. Yep. Who else is in that from the same band? Uh, let's see. Jerry Fielding. Okay, so the three of you kind of branch out and do Seeger as well. Yeah. With uh, another guy, um, let's see if I can remember, Aaron Jodell and Jerry Strothers, cool. our guitarist, and Aaron Jodell on keys. Great. Yeah. yeah. And Dave singing, of course. Dave yeah, I've Forbes. seen the ads for Last Bullet. I was in the, uh, another band called Against the Wind with... Uh, oh, you were in that too? Oh, Goldstein. He runs a, yes. a really good outfit it's there with band. John Jameson. Yeah? Yeah. But I had to branch out and do other things. Yeah. And so they're uh, carrying on. So it's a it's a Bob Seger duel in, in uh, Toronto right now. I wouldn't I say it's a duel. They do big soft seat theaters. Oh, we uh, do small okay. clubs. Oh, right on. <laughs> okay. So you've got your niche. Yeah. And uh, same sort of thing with the uh, Skinner band. You've got a, a, the opposite niche on that one. You do you the bigger it. shows. I see. Okay. Well, Goldstein's outfit is phenomenal, especially with the three backup women singers they have. It's 10, 10 11 piece band. You can't compete with that on a large stage. <laughs> so you did a, a Black Sabbath thing too. Oh, yes. Uh, well, I was in Rod's band. Uh, he hired me back in 2003 to go to Quebec with him just out of the blue because his bass player couldn't make it. Took me again two years later. Then uh, hadn't seen him for a few years. Uh -huh. Then in uh, That's Rod. 2008, the rock and roll heaven, Rod had hired me yet again to do one more show, a Halloween party. Then after the show was over, he put his arm around me and told the audience that I'm the newest member of the band. And I'm thinking, dude, I... I thought it was only here for one night. Oh, thank you. One night cool. turned into how many years now? 12 years? You've known uh, Rod. 12 years. Wow. I mean, 12 years up until recently. Uh, he's sort of molded with uh, Sons of Sabbath and Crazy Babies together, and uh, Nick okay. has got a bass player who he likes a lot. And oh, I see. So you're sort of on a hiatus from Crazy Babies. Yeah, I'm on a hiatus. Well, I had to focus more on the two bands I'm in. You right. know, They still hire me every now and then when their other bass player doesn't show up. Sure. And it takes a lot of pressure off of me. So there's another Sabbath band, Sons of Sabbath. But uh, you were Crazy Babies with Rod and uh, somebody else semi-famous in that band. Uh, Ron Bechard? Ron Bechard. Oh, geez, yes. Ron Bechard. Yeah. Uh, uh, Crash Karma and yeah. Edwin Starr, I believe. Right on. So uh, do you want to talk about any other favorite people that you've jammed with in uh, any of these bands? Oh, geez, I hate everybody. <laughs> No, actually, I don't. I just... Uh, You're so Hollywood. So Hollywood. <laughs> I go to the jams. Uh, it took me a while to figure out because I have a bit of an ego problem. How's that? Uh, well, I just wasn't set up for jams. I always want perfection. I always want everything to snap. But I realized, well, a lot of people it's, aren't at that level, but they so want to be there. Right. And so... 
you go up there on stage and you help out. You play with them. You know, like right. I know when I'm up there playing with Dale, or if I'm on guitar playing with Stan. It's Dale like, Harrison. I'm in. I'm in heaven. Too. These are my <laughs> idols, yeah. right? And, and these are yeah. professional musicians, and I have to realize that it works the other way around too. People aspire. People want to like you. They don't want to like a dick. Well, and and sometimes that's okay because you know. Guys like you and me are good at burning bridges that lead to nowhere or lead from nowhere. So I'm a self-actualizing asshole. Yeah, why not? Just realizing it. I even created um, a website on Facebook called Being an Asshole. Really? Yeah, yeah. Tell us about that. Well, I was looking on Facebook one day and it's asking questions. It says, uh, works at. Where do you work at? When I first got the web page and I I thought that was just for comedy. Well, you know, what do you work at? People think work. I know I work at being an asshole. That's what I'm good at. So I figured uh, I'd open up a page. So I kept putting being an asshole, being an asshole, and it wouldn't accept it. Then Facebook came back with a suggestion. Why don't they put a capital on being? Capital B on being. That's all it was? And they accepted it. (laughs) It's being accepted. So now I have being an asshole. It's for assholes who want to change if they have to. It's like alcoholics. You know you're an alcoholic. The power of knowing that you're one will keep you in control. Yes. Because, uh... So you're serious. Yeah. Yeah, because, uh... It's almost like cognitive behavioral therapy in saying admitting is the first... She hates going to karaoke with me, and uh, sometimes people used to hate going to jams with me because I'd be one of those... What are they, incels, as they call them, when before I was on meds years ago, and I go, well, I'm better than that, this, that, you know, folded arms, and now I realize, no. But what is it, like, Simon Cowell, why do you want to be a singer? I remember my first gig was right when I was 17 in my first band. My first band was called We Never Heard of You Either, (laughs) with uh, Rob Bradler and Fred Bradler and uh, Andy Brecker singing. Uh... I was only to do play and sing one song at night because I was kicked out because of my drinking problem. <laughs> and there's three high schools at the 30 Denton Green Room down there. I lived at 30 Denton. There was 450 people at this party, and I was to get up and sing and play one song, Born to be Wild. So I get up there, grab my bass. How old were you? Uh, 17. I drank about six beers. I had an empty stomach, and a friend of mine pops me a bean and an acid and of course I do them right away and so I get up there I'm just getting high and I'm ready to start singing board to be well get your motor run in then as soon as the chorus comes up I can feel something gurgling in my stomach <laughs> and this is a small little room everybody's like packed up to the stage in front of you right and as soon as I born to be Whoa, big wow. sea of foam came out and spewed six feet forward and everybody <laughs> parted like the Red Seas to let this giant spew go, man. It was disgusting. I should have, like... This is your first gig. My first gig, and I'm a person who's not very popular, so it should have just turned me into a serious introvert at that point. Wow. I should have been picked on for the rest of my life, but I was so high on acid. <laughs> And all of a sudden, about 10 it's minutes later, hour. people are banging the table. Fish up, fish up, fish up, fish up. They wanted me to get up and do the song over again. No, they just wanted me to puke again. Do the puking thing. Do the puking thing. So I got up on the microphone and I said, nobody saw The same saw mic or was it a clean one? That stuck oh, well, they took the foam off. They took the foam cup off at that point. And I did the song again and did it perfectly with my bass solo and everything. And... After it was over, I fell into a flurry of hands and pettings and everything, and everybody thought I was the coolest person. Considering I was not very popular back then, it was like an epiphany for me. You were like the karate kid of bass players at the time, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, the one who the one who made it to the end, and then... They just almost. wanted to see me puke again. Yeah, so. okay. <coughs> Touche. So I was going to ask you if you had any funny stories from the road. If that question shot down. Uh, well, <laughs> what, um, favorite gigs I've done. Ah, okay. You know the question. Well, I'd have to say the uh, first real favorite gig was not actually in Southern Fried or the Bob Seeger tribute. It was with Rod in, in Quebec. <laughs> we tailed, uh, toured up there. They hired Dale Harrison on drums, and I just met Dale's Dale that year. And it was kind of mind-blowing to be working with Bayshard and Dale Harrison, two rock stars in my eyes. 
and me and Rod on, well, I'm playing bass and Rod singing. Uh, everywhere we went, it was mayhem. Uh, Victoriaville, there had to be at least 8,000 people, maybe 10,000 people in this outdoor audience and huge stage. Everything was on bass amps and everything were on these big giant platforms which were slid out and back in for all the different bands. It was a three-day weekend party. They gave us a beer tent and they gave us like 48 beer. And everywhere we went, everybody thought I was James Hatfield. It was getting a little nerve-wracking at some points. After uh, we were coming back, we went to Montreal to stop for breakfast on our way back to Toronto after the whole shows were over. And we went into this restaurant and a man started who owned the restaurant came out and started serving us. Uh, he was like over, over serving us in a way. At some point, I had to say, uh, why are you giving us so much food? I see everybody else here has got this. And he goes, I, what else would I do? I have to make Mr. Hetfield feel like he's at home. And at that point, uh, Dale and Bashar are looking at each other and Roger, and they're beginning to laugh. And I had to tell the guy, no, I'm not James Hetfield. And the guy brought all this food out for us to eat. Like, he gave us a real special treat. I felt bad. But uh, oh, you were still an asshole. All the time. I, I I was not quite honest with him. I actually pulled out my ID because someone in the kitchen was a real Hetfield fan and told him I was James Hetfield and seen him in concert and everything. So he was absolutely sure I was him. So I had to go and show the cook. No, I'm from Ontario. My name is Fish. I'm from Scarborough. Yep, I was a uh, hired gun back then. Hmm. And uh, first time I worked with Dale, <laughs> that was pretty is it? cool. Oh yeah. And yeah, that's the first time headstone. I met him and found out he was with the, uh... The Headstones? Yeah, the uh, Headstones, and I was like, uh, wow, <laughs> cool. Well, I was actually going to talk about how I got into music in the first place. Is that where we're at now? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't really get into bio. Yeah. But, okay, you go for it, man. Yeah, it was like uh, maybe five years old, and I had a problem. Every time I would see a crack and I'd step on it, I'd have to do the obsessive compulsive ritual of counting to four, forwards and backwards, everywhere I went. So everywhere I went, it was one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one, one, two, three, four, four, three, four. And this didn't stop until I actually wanted a piano and I was playing one when I was seven years old at a friend's house and I put it to use for me. So I asked mom for a piano and she goes, no, no, we got a guitar, it's over there in the corner. So. At the time, I guess you had to get a, a, a really big piano. Like, there was no Casios when, you, when we were kids. Exactly. And for not having a piano, I would have been a phenomenal piano player if I got one when I was five. Mm -hmm. No. What had happened? In 2006, I ended up being a piano mover. Wow. That's what you get for not learning to play pianos. You end up moving them for the next <laughs> nine years. Miss the piano moving muscle, so. I got to move for some pretty famous people. I'm not sure if these are just the things that contribute to your musical career or both websites that you maintain. <laughs> well, thank God I didn't get into waltz because it'd be one, two, three, one, two, three, and missing the one. <laughs> so you must have some crazy piano moving stories. Did you ever move a piano for a famous person or All to the a time. famous place? All the time. Uh, I got one funny story. Uh, it was uh, moving a piano, a nine-foot grand, at the John Bassett Theater for Cindy Lauper oh. for Canadian Idol. And she basically got mad at me. And there was also a story about setting up a piano in the same theater for Roger Hodgson. I test the pedals by playing Lord Is It Mine, and he looked at me and gave me a wink as if to say, yeah, you're here, fuck off now. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty cool. Stole Tom Jones From chocolates. Which is Cindy Lauper. Yep, I'm moving a nine foot grand in the John Bass Theater for Canadian Idol. And when we're setting up a 1,300 pound instrument, we got to have silence on the stage. She's rehearsing with the winners that week, playing along, sitting in her chair with the acoustic guitar. And so I can't set up the piano. And I, uh, we're ready to set up the piano, but I had to talk to uh, Pacey Shulman, who's the stage manager for CTV. He goes up to her, and you could tell by his body language powering down to meet her on eye level in the chair. He whispers to her and she looks at me and she goes, like a chicken with Tourette's syndrome. Fuck, 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 Does this hand thing. <laughs> How long is this gonna take? Oh my God. <laughs> uh, 20 minutes, I almost said ma'am. I stopped short of it. <laughs> oh man. Fuck, 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 20 minutes, fuck, fuck. 
Yeah, so 20 minute break. <laughs> the dogs in the neighborhood are responding. <laughs> got to set up the piano and uh, got out of there, no problem. Just but to let you know, Cindy, the dogs in the neighborhood responded. <laughs> Apparently, I ruined a moment for it. It was a perfectionist moment where she was rehearsing with these people, but my light limit, time limit to the dock demanded that I had to have her stop. Otherwise, we can't set up this nine foot grand. <clears throat> a lot of people don't understand that there's a lot of setup involved. In stars having a good life. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So you you've got a lot of history on that too. Do you want to talk about your most recent regular job? Because I do want to get into gear with you. So if you want to talk about any of the gear that you've recently worked with or are acquiring in vast. Oh well, for years. Gear guy, go. I was just lucky to be a bass player because uh, well, I'm off the drugs now. Just marijuana and beer. But I never had any money to buy any real equipment for myself, and people would always go out of their way. Rod would always find me an amp. Dave would always lend me his amp. Everybody would lend me their amps. And now I had the one fretless bass that ever worked. But now that I'm clean and I got the job at Westbury last year, I started saving all sorts of money, and I discovered a new cocaine. It's called buying used. Shopping. <laughs> Shopping. <laughs> all of a sudden, I've got... I was always borrowing Dave's bass amp, so all of a sudden I've got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bass amps now. <laughs> I can go I large, I can go in stereo, I can go with one bass with stereo speakers, I can go any way. I've got up to 1600 watts, I've got two guitar amps, I've got eight basses now. Well, anyways, I'm a gearhead now, I'm a gear junkie, thank God. Yeah. At least I could turn around What's and What's the sell goal? It. Is it just happiness or... Uh, well, it's basically got everything I need now, and she's saying, you don't need that, you don't need that, you don't need that, until she saw the resonator base and thought, you that's, don't have that yet. That's where I pan over to Diane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that, Chips? Yeah, she oh. bought me a resonator base. Mm, oh. Fender. Mm. You did for his birthday? Did you know you did it? It wasn't for his birthday, I just, he didn't have one. Oh. I didn't have that acoustic, acoustic with a resonator yeah, thing so. on it. It's a real bluegrass sound to it. It really looks tinny, cool. noisy. It looks cool. I pitched in for it. So yeah, you can never have enough equipment. So I don't bitch about him having equipment at all. No, it's his job. It's his job, it's and, his job. and but you are always there. He didn't understand. Uh, have you all ever the missed shoes. a show? I, I want shoes for every outfit. Only when she was now he sitting. understands my shoes for every outfit. He needs a guitar for every sound. Oh, I was calling every... pedals shoes for a long time. Yes, so <laughs> I need new shoes. There's, I owe oh, this. Is this right is shoe. there's, there's I need a shoe are. closet now. Like for fuck's sake. True. <laughs> you can just get some for the color. There's I've got like 39 pedals now. For fuck's really? Sakes. Yeah. I set up for anything that I might need. If I'm doing funk, I got synth pedals. If I'm doing heavy metal, I got heavy metal. If I'm doing country <coughs> rock in any genre, bass or guitar. See, that's the perfect bass player. Anything, anywhere, any genre. He can play multiple um, instruments as well, not just. Yeah. So it was kind of, you know, it was one of those things when I when I did try and break back into music a little bit. It was kind of sad for me because I had to compete with guys like this. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. The sound from your amp will you do up. it. The sound from my amp is pretty cool, though. Yeah, it does. It's got a grind on the, it, the which I thought I gotta have, and that's why I got a, about four drive pedals to try to copy it. And now I never unplug it, so it doesn't do that screech. Oy. The tubes are like... Always gone. They're always warm. Yep. And that way it actually lasts longer because they're not being jolted off and on all off the time. Off and on. Contracting and expanding. Kevin Porter of the Art Zone record, recording studio never turned off his tube amps in his studio, his uh, own private studio. Because yeah. he says, you turn them off, you're putting strain on it. That's the strain. Mm -hmm. Expansion and contraction. Mm -hmm. Just keep it warm. Oh, that's well. For my solid state uh, bass amps, I got actually uh, Art MP and a Behringer tube preamp. Oh, nice! And it really does give you a tube sort of compression to it. I do notice a difference when I put it in my uh, solid state amps, but when I have my amp peg, it's already got a tube preamp and don't use it there. I'm not a huge gear guy, mm -hmm. but you can talk more about gear. But I do want to go back into a biographical. Uh, Thing where who were your influences? Influences. I mean, other than the obvious <coughs> tributes that you're doing, you got some bass I players would. that you must have liked, and and within the city too. Like who are your kind of uh, 
of mutual respect, brothers and babies. Ah, uh, let's see. <laughs> mm, Jeff Jones was an inspiration. He actually let me play his bass once. That's cool. From Burton Cummings Band and Carpet Frog? Uh, he was working with Robbie Ray at the time at a place called Downtown Browns back in 1990. 1990. Ed Bernard was hired as their guitarist. Oh, yeah. And that's how I got to meet most of the Saga band that were working with Robbie Ray at the time. And uh, let's see. Well, Stan recently. That's pretty cool. Great guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. And what about growing up? Growing up. Well, let's see. Right off the bat, it was Paul McCartney. Because oh. as a bass player, like the guy taught you majors and minor scales right off the bat, the way he played a song. He just didn't go, da 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 you know, ba da 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 or either. Mm -hmm. you know, major and minor voicings where that was always lacking in other rock songs. Just to quote Paul, he always respected Bach, I think. Bach bass lines. Bach? I think so. Get Bach to where he once belonged? Yes, I think he, I think he likes the, mm. or maybe it was Mozart's bass line, but he likes one of those classical guys' bass lines especially. Whatever gets your rock man enough, I always say. Woohoo! <laughs> Put that one on your list. Mm -mm. Oh my gosh. I know I can't handle it either. Oh man. Mm -mm. There were classical jokes I used to tell on the piano moving. Because uh, we had piano moving uh, when we used to go to places, they were higher echelon customers, and I used to make classical musician jokes, and then they got redundant all the time. I used to write CBC jokes when I used to go to uh, Studio 10 to deliver uh, George Strombopoulos piano for a show. Hmm, and he even told me to write new jokes one time. I think that my joke was, this piano has more fingerprints than Maggie Trudeau's ass. And, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, but uh, I heard you say it last time. Uh, Maybe you better write some more. <laughs> That's a Mick Jagger joke. <laughs> yeah, I just sort of adopted it. Yeah, there, you got CBC humor, right? Like, <laughs> make fun of something Canadian. That's mm. a Justin Trudeau joke. Yeah, Justin Trudeau. <laughs> just in time for it. Mm. Oh, I'm so tacky. Uh, more, more bass influences. Bass influences. Paul McCartney. Yeah, Paul McCartney. Then it was, uh, oh, Elton John's bass player. Like, oh, whenever cool. you're in the 70s as a kid and you're listening to your parents radio which had a delco radio with a delco speaker isn't that interesting we don't know his name nobody mentioned elton john's bass player's name oh, i don't know his name either my yeah, god that, that, <laughs> but he was one of the biggest influences on me so do you think it was him or just elton's left hand oh it was him really okay. oh yeah when you hear island girl or philadelphia oh, freedom you know in the 70s well, the most prominent sound in the car was the bass note. You know, you hear Island Girl in the car in the 70s and you just hear that low, low thing. And, yeah. and that was the melody lines that I always hummed because they really stood out the most. But I actually started out as a guitarist. Yes, I know Because right after juvenile delinquency, I had to find something to do because, <laughs> you know, you're curfew at that point. <laughs> so my mom's guitar, which said, it's in the corner over there, you know, I finally picked it up and started playing. And the first two chords I played book I thought this song suits me so I play the E minor and the A major then I realized I'm playing the theme from MASH oh. it appealed to me because the song's name was Suicide is Painless I thought oh I'm gonna kill myself today. fuck I'm mocked already because it's the theme from MASH are we at the uh, favorite places we did Talk, that what about the Molly Hatchet ah Molly Hatchet that was quite unique no, we opened up for them twice. Was this once at the Sound Academy? Or? It was twice at both rock piles. rock piles. East and West. East and West. Yay, Rock Pile East, the old knobby, which has now been torn down Whoop. just recently. Just recently. So tell us more about it. Uh, well, we wanted some legitimacy, and uh, an opportunity was presented our way that Molly Hatchet wanted us to open for them, and we jumped on it, but uh, it came with a bit of a price. So How We only did it for one basic reason. And that we knew we were going to get paid, but we wanted promo material to show our pictures in our files with a Molly Hatchet sign hanging from the ceiling behind us so we could say, hey, we opened for Molly Hatchet. There is a proof. There it is. And were they cool? Uh, they actually, uh, Pete, the singer, yeah. God rest, rest his Pete, rest oh, his soul, he died uh, six months ago. Oh, gosh. Came up to me and said I was one great bass player and I got to get me a 20, 10-gallon hat. 
<laughs> he said, get a 10-gallon hat. And he said, we were a great-sounding band, and they'd hire us to do anything stateside, too, but never panned out. That would be great. Well, it was uh, memorable for us. Even We didn't make any money, but it was our work with fame. Yeah. Uh, we did get to open for the Georgia Satellites once. Oh. I forgot about that. Jeez, that was like Where 2011. Was that? that was the oh, Sound yeah. Academy. That was Sound Academy. Because I remember seeing the Southern Pride pictures or videos from that. I posted a video on Facebook maybe a month ago uh, ah. with a couple of the songs. But, uh, yeah, it was uh, presented to us from uh, Joe Brett. Yeah. And uh, Hey, he, Joe, he's been on the show. Yeah, and uh, he told Randy Charlton, who already knew me and Dave. Randy's a great guy, too. Hey, Randy. <laughs> hey, guys. Tag, and tag. Uh, they called us in to do the show, and uh, we brought all our amps, and uh, apparently the guys were good enough to let us use their amps. Oh, uh, here wow. I'm bringing the Dave's small little bass <laughs> amp, and all of a sudden I'm working with this Marshall stack or something. And, oh, it was phenomenal. Dave actually got to meet all the band and uh, got his album signed in the back oh, room. Yeah. Randy... Uh, Mickey took him backstage, Mickey Power. Mickey, and, yeah. And introduced them hey, all, Mickey. but I was out busy doing other things and partying and being an asshole, as I usually am. Yeah. Missing all the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and so you didn't see, you didn't meet the man? I didn't get to meet them. Oh, okay. I was too busy drinking the extra beer Randy brought us. Thank you for that extra two for <laughs> He was so impressed with the show. Randy's <laughs> great. Love Randy. Oh, it was an experience of a lifetime. So Randy's now at the Phoenix, or at least was most recently at the Phoenix, but that was Sound Academy, which is now other favorite places to play. We were supposed to open up uh, the uh, Gables in Grand Bend for uh, Kiefer Sutherland, but his band didn't make it up there for uh, some reason. Huh. And we ended up doing the headlining show, and it turned oh. out pretty good. Oh, great. Good accommodations. And another place we played over the summer last year was Sable Beach, where we're uh, and we opened up for band. Carl Dixon and Coney Hatch. Oh, right on. Yeah, and uh, that was a really good show. They so it was actual Coney Hatch, like Andy Kern was there too? Yeah. Yes. Ah, that's band. great. All yes. original members. Well, great. they had Tom Kelly on guitar. Uh, cool. Uh, they liked us. And, and which was band cool. was opening for that? That was the Southern Pride Band opening? Yep. Great. I was quite surprised that Carl Dixon actually remembered my name from Facebook. Huh. Because we had a chat once on Facebook about me being from Halliburton, then uh, he recognized me and goes, oh, you're Chris Bishop. And I went, oh, hey, it's awesome. Facebook world. Oh, yeah. I met an infamous person one, twice, actually. Pete Best. Pete Best is drummer for... The Beatles. The, the, the fifth. Back in 19... The original, the original Pete Best. The original yes, Pete yes. Best. Right he came to Canada and did a tour of the nation, and he ended up playing mm -hmm. the Beacon Brook in Halliburton for like uh, 15 bucks a head to get in. In 1990, really? that was kind of expensive, so we all went. Yeah. Great gentleman. Then I ran into him again a year and a half later at Chum AM at the Chum Building. Oh, cool. On, Saint, on Young and St. Clair? Yeah, they were having a Beatlemania thing. They had Beatlemania on the roof of the building playing. Oh. And I went up and talked to Pete Bess and told, talk about Halbert and see if he remember me. He wasn't too sure if he did remember me, but... <laughs> I asked him about what his music career was doing. I didn't ask him any Beatles questions at all. Yeah. So he spent a lot of time with me talking. Oh, that's great. And as I was walking away, that's sort of in bewilderment, I actually bumped into Cynthia Lennon and almost knocked her over. Wow. Uh, yeah, see you later. Oh, oh, sorry. Boom. <laughs> yeah, wow. Alan Waters saved her. Any recording projects? Uh, well, <laughs> me and Dave are sort of aspiring. He's got a 24 digital track machine. And he's putting it together, but uh, a matter of time, it'll get together and we'll start recording at Dave's house. Right. Okay. Recording Dave's ideas. I don't really have any ideas. I used to years ago. Once you start recording, you might. Hopefully Dave will get that off the ground soon enough. Right. I'm looking forward to it. Mm, we've got all the equipment to do it with. I've just recently acquired a PA myself. Did you? What kind? Uh, uh, an MP6, uh, Yorkville. I mean, six, six channels. channels. Yeah. Six channels is all I really need. And how many watts? Two, uh, well, it's uh, 160 watts a side, and yeah. I got two 15 inch speakers, which are rated oh, at 200, and I've also got a 700 you watt are, subwoofer. You are a one man show now. All you need is a stage. Hey, man, uh, when you add a subwoofer to a small system like that, it's yeah. twice as loud. Absolutely. <laughs> well, 700 watts of subwoofer really adds a boom to it. It does. That's I didn't really I realize how much it acts to a voice, too, especially when you're doing low. 
you know, really? the, the mid-range speakers never cover it, but now uh, Southern Fried's going to have a subwoofer, and Dave's voice will be even better sounding now. Really? It actually, voice well, goes into the sub? Oh, yeah. Anything that's low-frequency response. Huh. So if I sing low, like I was testing the whole PA yeah. system with the microphone going bow, 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 and you could just feel oh, wow. it. You could feel my voice going bow, bow. Learn something new every day. Mm. So if you got a small PA system, just add a subwoofer to it. You're twice as loud already. <laughs> Seriously. And it's portable in the car. I can fit it all in the car. <laughs> Tell us about your amping process. Well, after st uh, I started buying my own amps, uh, Roland bought me one years ago, and I used it profusely, but I was always running it too hard, so uh, I kept blowing amps for some strange reason. I blew three amps in a row three different ones that I bought and they all got wasted. I got them all fixed since I got to Westbury, but I figured a policy now would be just to take two amps with me wherever I go, because they're not very powerful, and just buy amp them. That way I've got them running both at half power, but at the same time I get the unique Chris Squire blend or the uh, Billy Sheehan blend where one amp is completely clean and the other amp's got all the effects and all the dirt and all the grind because whenever you have grind, you're taking away a lot of your bottom end. Yeah. Sucks it away. You still want to have that with the clean half, blending with the dirty half. Huh. So, so I what's it, the name? It's not 50-50 or something. Like, uh, the, you really got to dial it in, you dial it in? volume-wise, right. what you feel like, whether from the pedals or from the amps. But okay. I try to have the amps equal and just dial everything from my pedals to get that equal sound. Cool. Because I like my grind in it, and I've got options to make it complete. I could do everything from heavy metal to rage to reggae with just a couple of steps on the switch. Hmm. But the idea of having just buy amp, one clean and one dirty. And if I want to go big, and if I'm doing a big stage, I just bring out the uh, Ampeg SVT4 Pro, which is already buy amp built in. Hmm. And spring two cabinets and Very work cool. through that. Interesting. Yeah. And that's a Chris Squire thing, Billy Sheehan. Yep. Huh. Well, it was basically because they got the Rickenbacker, they had the stereo sound, you needed ah. two amps, so the uh, neck pickup got the clean amp. In Chris Squire's case, he plugged the uh, hot end into a dirty amp with distortion and drives and stuff like that that would make it grind. And he blended up with his clean sound, so he'd have two amps. He took it everywhere. Not so much that he blew amps everywhere, but that's because that was his sound. Rickenbackers were designed in the 60s for two amps. Oh, yeah. Even some of their guitars. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we covered that on the gear gap. Yeah, I haven't blown an amp since. <laughs> Great. All right, thanks again, man. All right, thank you. Cheers. So that's it. So, Fish, thanks for being musicians on the grass. Oh, I <laughs> apologize to your editing department. <laughs> I'm scared. I think we got about two and a half hours. Mike, so we'll whittle it down to 10 minutes. Yeah, that'll be fun. <laughs> oh, the fish and chips portion. Oh my gosh, it's both of you. Uh, what makes, I think music is very primeval from the first time we were beating on a drum 80,000 years ago. The first bone flutes found in Germany 60,000 years ago. It's just driven into us. It was a communication, even if we couldn't articulate language at that point and stage in our Pretty human verbal. history, it was something we all understood to be part of a social group because, uh, well, Dance we together. are a sociable creature. Yep, even if we're six feet apart. And that means <laughs> yep. getting together and <laughs> dancing and stuff like that and anything that created a rhythm, whether, uh, well, even in Africa, there's communication by drum beats. In the Canary Islands, there's whistling to communicate words. This is like the most well thought out answer to that question you've ever heard. That question is from Woodstock, circa 1960 something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just watching that VHS today, so I thought I'd ask Fish what he thought. What do you think, Chips? Let him deal with the history of music. I just like to sing it. Awesome. Yep. Wasn't it awesome that Rick Sanford popped in on us? That was <laughs> kind of freaky. That was very cool. <laughs> kind of freaky. That came out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. Very out of cool. nowhere. All right, guys. Thanks for being on. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I am honored. Cheers. <laughs>